darkest nights You were close like no other I've known you as a father Oh, I've known you as a friend And I have lived in the goodness of God Oh, oh, oh. cause all my life you have been faithful And all my life you have been so, so
sing these words out together. Death could not hold the veil told before you. Silence the bones of sin and rain. The heavens are Grab a seat, church family. I want to welcome you here on this Palm Sunday. If you're here for the first time or the first time in a long time, it's so good to see you. My name's Jason. I'm one of the pastors here on staff, and we'd love to get connected with you. We'd love to just kind of help you take a step in your spiritual journey to become a better disciple for Jesus. And we'd love to do that. Easy way for you to do that is take out your phone anytime during the service, and there's a little tag on the back of the seat backs. Take your phone, tap it to that tag, and you'll have some choices pop up, and just click on the connect. And we would love to just connect with you and help you take a step towards Jesus. Well, it's Palm Sunday. And it's the day as we kind of kick off the Passion Week. And in the book of Mark, chapter 11, it says this. It says, they, the disciples, they said what Jesus told them to say. And they did what Jesus told them to do. Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their garments over it. And he sat on it. Many in the crowd spread their garments on the road ahead of him, and others spread leafy branches they had cut in the fields. Jesus was in the center of the procession, and the people all around him were shouting, Praise God! Blessings on the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessings on the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Praise God in the highest heaven. And what I love about that passage, it says that Jesus was at the center of the procession. Jesus was the reason for all that. And so as we come into this Passion Week, as we enter into this final week of, of Jesus' life here on earth, we are just going to make sure that we make Jesus the center of it all. And so here as a church, we have a couple of ways to help you do that. This morning, we started some online devotionals that you can download, you can watch online and follow throughout the week. Uh, we also, on Thursday, kick off our Stations of the Cross all the way around our lake from Thursday afternoon all the way through Sunday. You can go and have a guided tour uh, just through the different stations, the different places that Jesus went on his journey to the cross. And ultimately, we know that there's an empty tomb. And so we're going to be together on Friday at 
afternoon for our Good Friday service. And then we're going to be back getting ready for Easter. Easter on services on Saturday at 4 p.m. And then Sunday morning, sunrise out by the lake at 7, back in here at 9 and 11 a.m. as we celebrate the fact that, yes, Jesus died, but the hope we have is that tomb was empty. And so we're going to be together next week. So I hope you'll take some time this week to continue praying about who you're going to invite. If you haven't got a card yet or someone to be able to invite, I encourage you to grab a card on the way out and and be thinking about praying about who you can bring with you to church because it's going to be a powerful, powerful weekend together here. And I just want to point you to one thing coming up. Part of our Rooted initiative is an opportunity for us to to lean into marriage for the next 50 years around this church. And so one of the things we want to do is we're just kicking off this initiative is two weeks after Easter on April the 12th, on Friday night, we're going to have a a night to, to really lean into our marriages. And so a good friend of mine, Steve Weatherford and his wife, Laura, are going to be with us. Steve was here a year and a half ago. You might remember Steve. Uh, He's a former uh, NFL great, won a Super Bowl. He was a punter and he had just a little bit of energy. Maybe you remember that guy. And so he and his wife, Laura, are going to be back and share a little bit of their story and, and how they've learned to have a healthy marriage and hopefully give us some tips on how to have a healthy, thriving marriage. So if you want more information about that, I encourage you to go online, check that out. You could sign up for that and be a part of a really fun evening. I encourage you to invite some friends and neighbors. It's going to be a good time. Well, today we're getting close to wrapping up Genesis. Next week on Easter, we're going to wrap up our journey through 50 chapters of the book of Genesis. And so today, Greg is going to be bringing the last chapters of chapter 48 and 49 as we set up next week. And so would you join me as we pray and ask God to open up our hearts to what he has to share with us today. Jesus, we thank you so much for this day and the opportunity we have this week to make you the center of everything. And so I pray this week as we move into this Passion Week, Jesus, that we'll make sure that you are front and center. And so, Jesus, we just want to say thank you for what this week means to our lives. Because of this week, what you did during this week, we have a hope and we have a future in you. And so, Jesus, we thank you. And I pray today as we're getting towards the end of our journey through Genesis, I just pray that you'll give the words to Greg today to share the truth of your gospel and you'll open our hearts to hear what we need to hear today. We love you, Jesus. Thank you for all that you do for us. And it's in your holy and your precious name we pray. Amen. Shrouded in darkness, chaos is all we see. Violence, oppression, and destruction surround us. No matter how dark the situation becomes, we are reminded of these two words, but God. But God won't let our hearts be troubled. The storm is raging on, but God will calm the sea. The enemy is attacking, but God will overcome. In this life, we will have many tribulations, but God, will have the last word. God is not done. Well, hey, good morning. And uh, for the last decade of my life, I lived uh, right next to Biscayne Bay. And if anybody knows anything about Biscayne Bay, it's this beautiful bay along the southeast part of Florida. And I would drive by there almost every day of my life. And so as I go by, there's, there's it's just this beautiful bay. And what you would notice, right, is what boats, there's just boats everywhere. There's these marinas and there's docks, but they would have these boats that would be on these buoys all out in the bay, right? And so there's this mooring buoy that would be there and the, the boat would be connected to it. And there's this heavy chain that would go down. And then at the bottom, right, at the surface level or the, the ground level, right, there is an anchor. And the idea right, if it's done correctly, right, is the currents are gonna come, the tides are gonna come in, tides are gonna go out, the wind's gonna blow, right, and there's gonna be storms, Florida, there's storms that crop up all the time, but the reality is, if it is secure, right, if the anchor is secure, and if the chain to the buoy and the boat is secure, the boat's gonna what? It's gonna, it's gonna move, it's gonna sway back and forth, it's gonna come up and down with the tides, but it's gonna be secure, right? It's not going to drift, it's going to be secure. Firm and secure. So 
I want to start with a question I want to ask you this morning. What is your anchor? What is that thing in your life, that one thing that keeps you firm and secure? Because kind of like the boat, right? Life's going to happen, right? Currents are going to come. Tides are going to come. The wind's going to blow. There are going to be storms in your life. Like it or not, the reality is life will be hard at times. And so we have to wrestle with this question is what is going to be your anchor? What's going to be that thing that holds you that rock. And for some, again, there's a lot of people in this room. For some of you, maybe you would say, well, well Greg, it's, it's my spouse. I mean, my spouse, he or she, they're like a, they're like a rock. Or, or maybe it's a, a mom. My mom was the rock of the family. Or my dad was the rock of the family. Maybe you're in a place where you say, man, I'm just, the rock is just financial security. I mean, we just, I've just worked myself to a place where, where I've got money in the bank, rainy day fund. I, I'm just in a very secure place. It's, it's this, or maybe it's your house or your job or your degree or your career. What is it that is your anchor? Years ago, there was a, a, a young 25-year-old uh, guy who lived up in New York, and he came to, to Miami for spring break. And uh, it was, he was 25, came to South Beach, and uh, like a lot of people in the Northeast this time of year, they haven't seen the sky, they haven't seen the sun in like months. And so here's this kid, 25-year-old, he's at South Beach, he's like, wow, blue sky, sunshine. And he's playing in the water, he's playing in the waves. But what he didn't know is that it was a sandbar, and so he was just jumping, he was diving into the water, and he hit head on into a sandbar. It knocked him unconscious, and it fractured his neck. Now. Uh, that took about 45 seconds for the lifeguards on South Beach to get to the water to pull him out. And if you know anything, 45 seconds of inhaling salt water is not a good thing. And so later that day of that accident, I get a phone call from a pastor friend of mine in New York. And he says, Greg, I need you to do me a favor. I need you to go up to Jackson Memorial Hospital to the ICU. And I need you to see this, this guy. So I got my wife and we went over to Jackson and we went up to the ICU unit, and I'll never forget walking uh, into that ICU unit. And here was this 25-year-old young man, and he was laying on his back, and they had his hands kind of crossing his stomach, and there were tubes and wires and things going all over the place. And I walk into the room, and his dad was there. And I spent a few moments just talking to his dad, who obviously was upset. And I asked, I said, would it be okay if I pray? And this happened years ago, but I'll never forget. I, I reached over and I, I grabbed the top of his hands. And even as I'm telling the story, I can remember the feel of those hands. They were so cold and they were so clammy. And I, and I prayed a prayer as best I could pray in that moment. And we said our goodbyes and we walked out. And I'll never forget my wife, whose background's in nursing. She was like, Greg, the prognosis on this is not good. And I thought to myself, here's this 25-year-old young man. He had his entire life in front of him. I mean, vibrant, smart, brilliant, and just this fluke freak accident on the beach. And boom, his whole life is over. And I, and I was reminded of the words that the writer of Hebrew, Hebrews wrote to the church, the followers of Jesus. And, and he says these words, it's in Hebrews chapter six, verse 19. He says, we, we have this hope. We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. And what's he saying? We, who's the we? The, the writer of Hebrews is writing to followers of Jesus. He's saying, we, those of us who are followers of Jesus, he says, we have this hope. And again, the context of that, he's pointing out, he says, we have this hope, hope in Jesus, Jesus, the son of the living God. He says, we have this hope, this hope in Jesus that he's what? That he can be our anchor, that he can be our rock. He can be our one thing that, that it makes us firm and secure and not just our life and not just our body, but what he says, the soul, the core of us. And he says that that anchor is gonna be firm and secure. 
And what this metaphor from the writer of Hebrews is, is conveying is that no matter how chaotic your life gets, no matter who criticizes you, no matter who disappoints you, no, no matter who betrays you or leaves you, no matter what the economy does or who gets elected president or how disappointing the Jaguars continue to be, there is one thing in this life he says, there is one thing in this life you can count on all day long through the darkest night of the soul, and that's if you're in a right relationship with Jesus. If you're actively following him, if you're full of faith in him, the writer says, hey, he can be your anchor. The writer of Hebrews says he can be an anchor, and it's gonna be an anchor that is firm and secure. And so what, friends, is your anchor? Or maybe another way to say it is where does your loyalty lie? Now, if you've been around Christ Church for any point, you know that over the past year, we've been in a teaching series going through the book of Genesis, and we've been going section by section, chapter by chapter, and we're in the final two weeks of this journey. In the first book of the Bible, Genesis, it has 50 chapters and I don't have enough time, I don't have enough words or creativity to describe what happens in the 50 chapters. Again, you should read it for yourself. But it is a human, human story, and it is also a God story. And there's everything you could imagine, beginnings and jealousy and murder and build up and tear down and creativity and promise and hope and death, destruction and covenant and deception and dreams and mountaintops and deep valleys. And there's these amazing, great decisions made in faith. And there's these horrible, terrible decisions made in selfishness and pride. And it's just terrible. I don't even know you could show it on Bravo. Is, is that the worst channel? I don't even know. On Bravo TV, it's just terrible. But here's the thing, as we have journeyed through this, section by section, and as I have immersed myself into the text, there's one thing that keeps, that keeps coming up. It, it keeps sitting with me. There's like, it's like a thread. It's, it's like this, this common theme. It's like you could say maybe it was the rock or it was the anchor. The key players, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, uh, uh, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, and all the extras, right? They keep coming back to this over and over and over again. And it first pops up in Genesis 12, and God's speaking to Abraham. I'll read it to you real quick. Genesis 12, two. It says, I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make you famous, and you will be a blessing to others. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who treat you with contempt. And God says to Abraham, all the families of the earth will be blessed because of you. Everybody, every nation, every tongue, every person on the earth, every human will be blessed because of you. Again, these are God's words, and he's making this promise, or he's making this covenant. In a, in a version of this kind of covenant promise, it pops up all throughout the book of Genesis, uh, through all through these different chapters, and there's this key line. All the families of the earth will be blessed through you. So everything you read in this story, all the highs and lows, the good, the bad, the ugly, the terrible decisions, the great decisions, the turns, right? There's this one thread, this promise, this covenant, and it becomes like a, a rock or an anchor that holds it all together. All the families on the earth will be blessed through you. Now, the last few weeks, we've been looking at this guy named Joseph and his father Jacob, who's now in the picture, and today we're nearing the end, right? 50 chapters, and now we're kinda at the last end, the four, chapter 47, chapter 48, chapter 49, and I'm not gonna read the entire text to you. You're welcome. But I do wanna look at two scenes. I wanna look at two scenes that I believe kinda wrap this thing up before we head into Easter next week. So we're gonna look at Genesis chapter 47. If you've got a Bible, Genesis chapter 47, beginning in verse 27. Here's the first scene that I want us to look at as we close out the book of Genesis. Here's what the writer of Genesis says. Genesis 47, verse 27. He says, meanwhile, the people of Israel settled in the region of Goshen in Egypt. So they've come down from Canaan. They've settled in this part of Egypt called Goshen. It says, there they acquired property. They were fruitful and their population grew rapidly. Then he gives some context. Jacob, he lived for 17 years after his arrival in Egypt, so he lived 147 years in all. Verse 29. 
as the time of his death drew near, Jacob called for his son Joseph and he said to him, here's what he says, please do me this favor. And then he has him do this weird thing. Look what he does. He says, put your hand under my thigh and swear that you will treat me with unfailing love by honoring this last request. What's the request? Do not bury me in Egypt. When I die, please take my body out of Egypt and bury me back in the promised land, back in Canaan, with my ancestors. And so Joseph promised, I will do as you ask. And then he kind of, like one more time, I wanna hear it again, verse 31. Swear that you will do it, Jacob insisted. So Joseph gave him his oath. And Jacob bowed humbly at the head of his bed. Okay, now what's going on in this weird ancient scene? See, Jacob, the father, is forcing Joseph, his son, to choose his loyalty. Like, where where are you gonna be loyal? Is Joseph gonna be loyal to Jacob and the kingdom of God? Is Is he gonna hold to this thread, this rock, this promise, this covenant that we see in Genesis 12 and all through the book of Genesis? Or is Joseph gonna be loyal to Pharaoh and to Egypt? See, see, Joseph, it's like kingdom of God, kingdom of Egypt, right? Is, is it gonna be the promise, the covenant, this all the nations, all the families, everyone will be blessed. There's this grander, bigger purpose, or let's be honest, he got sold into slavery. He got sent to Egypt. No one came looking for him. His family, where are they? They're not here, right? He was thrown in a prison. He worked his way up. He worked hard. Now he's at the top. He's got all the money and all the power. He's got his wife, he's got his kids, he's got everything you could ever want. He did that himself, right? So what are you gonna do? What are you going to choose? Are you going to choose the kingdom of Egypt? Are you going to choose the kingdom of God? Where does your loyalty lie? And so here's this moment, okay, in in Genesis 47. They're having this moment, this kind of this recalibration, reset kind of moment. And he's like, what are you going to do? Like, what's going to be your rock? What's going to be your anchor? See, the reality is every single one of us in this room, like every day you make decisions. I make decisions. You make choices. And some of the choices are big. Some of the choices are small. But the, but the way that you decide, right, the, the, the choices that you make, it points toward this thing, this loyalty. Where, where does your loyalty lie? Like with whom or with what does your loyalty lie? Like what matters to you? And for Joseph, right, it's this kingdom language, kingdom of God, kingdom of Egypt. It, for you and me, I would probably frame it in this terms. I would frame it in, in more Christ church language and say it comes down to the idea of discipleship, of following Jesus, When you make a decision, when I make a decision, what does it say about your followership of Jesus? One of our key verses around here is Matthew chapter four, verse 19, right? And Jesus is is out and he looks at these fishermen and he says to them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men, right? Follow me. The way we say that right here is we make disciples. Follow me and I will make you, right? This is the idea of being transformed, being changed by the power of God, working inside of us. Like over time, right, we become more loving and compassionate and and, uh, we change, we transform, become more like Jesus. And the result of that, Jesus uses the language follower, uh, fishers of men. We would say we're on mission with Jesus, part of that grander, bigger purpose, bigger than us. What does it mean to follow Jesus? simple terms, we say like, Jesus is my leader, Jesus is my teacher, Jesus is my rock, or you could even say it this way, Jesus is my anchor. I, Greg, choose to follow Jesus. I choose to be his follower, I choose to be his apprentice. I am one of many who have found Jesus to be the most radiant light to ever grace the human scene. There is simply no better way no better truth, no better life than, than to be found than that in Jesus. Or as Dallas Willard would put it, he would say it this way. There is no problem in human life that apprenticeship to Jesus cannot solve. So what does it mean to follow Jesus? What does that mean for you? Again, Dallas Willard again. He says it this way. He says, the greatest issue facing the world today 
with all its heartbreaking needs is whether those who identify as Christians will become disciples, students, apprentices, practitioners of Jesus, steadily learning from him how to live the life of the kingdom of heaven in every corner of human existence. Or John Mark Comer would say it this way, the greatest issue facing us today is not climate change or human rights or the presidential election or border control or the ongoing wars or the specter of nuclear war, as crucial as these are. But he says, can you imagine how many of those problems would effectively be solved overnight if the billions of living humans who identify as Christians actually became disciples of Jesus? If their driving aim was to approach every challenge as Jesus would. These statistics tell us in the United States that about 63% in the United States would claim to be a Christian but yet only 4% would identify as a disciple, a follower of Jesus. You see, Jesus is not looking for converts to Christianity. He's looking for disciples in the kingdom of God. And this idea of disciple is, I'm going, to, I'm going to take my cues from Jesus, right? I'm going to study him. I'm going to seek him. I'm going to abide in him. I'm going to follow him. I'm going to try to think and act and be like him. I'm going to try to be with him, to become like him, and to do as he can. It's this idea of like sinking and aligning and being in step with him. He is my driving aim. Years ago, I uh, lived in Chicago and discovered it's cold And uh, I was living in Chicago and I had a friend who uh, had an apartment kind of around the block from where I lived and she bought this dog. And it wasn't just like your average little dog. It was like a massive yellow lab. And we're talking like 80 pound lab. And this dog was too strong and too powerful and too much for her. And so she's like, Greg, I need some help. Can you please help me walk this dog? It's like, okay, I'm sure it's cold, it's freezing outside. That's exactly what I want to do is walk around in the snow and walk your dog. But I did it, I guess, because I'm nice. And so I remember the first time I, I hook up this dog to the leash. And, and, and you, I've seen some of you out in the neighborhood. It looks like this, right? It's like, who's walking who? Are, are you walking the dog or the dog's walking you, right? And it's one of those where the dog is pulling so hard, right? And it's like, the, it's like your shoulder is gonna, it's gonna come out of socket, right? And I just remember the first few times walking this dog, I'm going, this is the most powerful, the strongest, the craziest dog I've ever been around. And this dog is pulling me. And God forbid if there was a squirrel or a cat or another dog, it was everything I had to try to hold this dog. This dog was crazy. But what happened over time? I'm no dog whisperer. I don't, I don't watch, what's that guy, Caesar or somebody? Yeah, 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 I've never seen him. Uh, I'm no dog whisperer, but what happened over time is the dog and I started to kind of figure this out. Like over time, over weeks, over months, we started to kind of figure this out. And what happened was the tension in the leash, instead of being more like here, became less and less. And we actually began to to walk together. Now, there were times when there were other dogs or squirrels or cats, and it was crazy. But over time, we began to walk and we began to be in step. And, And really what happened over a long period of time, there came a point when we would walk and I would actually drop the leash and I don't think he knew that I dropped the leash, but I would drop the leash. And we would walk step by step, side by side, in sync. And see, God's desire for you and for me is to live the life you were created to live. He, he, he created you with purpose and meaning. And there's, there's so much deep, deep reason to your life. But it's not about you. It's about something grander and bigger, and it aligns to this upper story of God of restoring and redeeming all people. And God desires for you, and he desires for me to be in alignment, to be in step, to be in sync, to let him be our guide, to let him be uh, our leader. See, this is what it means to be in the discipleship process. This is what it means to follow Jesus, this aligned in step with him. And I realize a room this size, there's all kinds of different people on all different places on your faith journey. 
<laughs> and on your discipleship journey. And, and there's some of you, maybe you came in here, maybe you're only here because somebody's gonna give you lunch after and let me know where you're going, I'll, I'll take, take that deal. And, and you're here and you're like, oh, I don't wanna be here. And God to you feels like that leash. It's just like, it's a tug, it's a tension. And it's like, it's just this mean God, he's just waiting for me to step out of line so he can whack me over the head with something, and then, right? And you feel this, this kind of tension. Some of you, you know, you're like, you know, like I really wanna follow Jesus. Like, it's in my heart, I really want to, but man, I'm just enjoying too many things right now. There's just some things that I feel like if I say yes and go all in with Jesus, I gotta say no to those, and so I'm kinda, you know, I'm gonna dip my toe in the Jesus pool every once in a while, but that's not really what I wanna do, and maybe you're here, you're just like, man, I just, what is the minimum standard? Like, what can I just get my free, get out of, out of hell card? I just want that, that's all I wanna do, I don't wanna do anything else. And see, the reality is none of us are perfect, <laughs> right? Every once in a while there's a cat or a dog or a, a squirrel or a shiny object and we drift. But see what, what this is, what, what he's talking about here, he's like, hey, it's not about perfection. It's not about following a bunch of list of rules. Following Jesus comes down to this, it's your heart, your driving aim. This, this loyal, where does your loyalty lie? What, what is your priority? What's gonna be that rock, that anchor in your life? And so here's this scene in Genesis 47. And, and Jacob, the father, and, and Joseph, the son, they're having this recalibrate, reset kind of moment. And, and, and it's this strange kind of ritual, right? It's this weird ancient thing that they're doing. But what are they doing? It's Jacob and Joseph reaffirming the covenant, reaffirming the promise that we saw in Genesis chapter 12. And it's Joseph saying, hey, I, I'm in. I'm going with God. I'm, go, I'm going to trust God. I'm going with the kingdom of God. And I'm gonna partner with him in this, all the people of the earth will be blessed. I'm going that way. Again, I ask you, what is your anchor? What's gonna be that rock? See, I, I, I wanna trust him. I wanna partner with him to bring the message of Jesus, right? Sink a line in step with him. Forsaking all others, I choose Jesus. Now, there's one more scene I, I wanna show you uh, from this before we wrap up. And, and so if you flip the page to chapter 49, uh, Jacob, the father, is gonna basically go through all of his sons and kind of give them this blessing. And some of them don't feel like a blessing. They feel more like a, like, dude, you're, you're messed up. And, but he's gonna go like son by son all through 12, and I'm not gonna read all of that. I just wanna look at one scene. And, and the, la the scene that I wanna look at this morning is Judah, who's the fourth born. There's this scene where he kind of has this blessing or these words over Judah right before he goes to his deathbed. Genesis 49, beginning in verse eight. Here's what he says. Jacob blessing Judah. Judah, your brothers will praise you. You will grasp your enemy by the neck. All your relatives will bow before you. Judah, my son, is a lion that has finished eating its prey. Like a lion, he crouches and lies down. Like a lioness who dares to rouse him. Now look what he says, verse 10. The scepter will not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from his descendants until the coming of the one to whom it belongs, the one whom all the nations will honor. Now there's some interesting uh, language and imagery here. There's a ton of backstory that would be fun to geek off in if we had more time. You can read Genesis 38 and Matthew chapter one, but here's what I want you to see today, right? The scepter, will not depart Judah, the ruler's staff from his descendants until the coming of who? The one who it belongs, the one to whom the all nations will honor. He, he's talking about the Messiah, the coming of the Messiah. And the key thing that I want you to see today is what he's talking about here is the fulfillment of the promise, the fulfillment of the covenant that started back in Genesis 12. This all the families, all the nations, all the people of the earth will be blessed through you. That's, he's talking about this and he's saying, hey, it's coming. How is it coming? It's coming in the person of the Messiah who is Jesus, the son of the living God. The fulfillment of Genesis 12, the promise of the covenant is He's saying basically, that rock, he's coming to you. That anchor, he's actually gonna come to you. And every single person has the opportunity or will be blessed through him, through Jesus Christ. Jesus, 
the son of the living God. He's coming to you. He's coming to me. He comes, he takes on human flesh. He lives among us. He eats and he sleeps and he walks just like we do. He taught and he healed and he loved and ultimately he went to a cross and took on all your junk and all your sin and all your shame on him so that you and I can be in a right relationship with God. And the promise, the fulfillment of the promise, the fulfillment of the blessing, the fulfillment of the covenant so that you and I can be in a right relationship to God through Jesus. He can be our anchor, or as that writer of Hebrews would say, we have this hope, this anchor for our soul. And if we, if we tap into the anchor, that anchor is firm and secure. And so today, we begin Easter week, Passion Week. Today is Palm Sunday. And we enter this week, and so I thought it would be appropriate on Palm Sunday to go back to the original Palm Sunday and look at it very quickly in John chapter 12. John chapter 12, beginning in verse 12. John, eyewitness account of the life of Jesus, here is what he writes. He says, the next day, the news that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem swept through the city. At this point, Jesus had just healed a Lazarus. He'd brought Lazarus back from the dead in John 11. So his popularity is up. And it says that a large crowd of Passover visitors, again, it was the Passover in the area, thousands and thousands, hundreds of thousands of people there. And so they took these palm branches and they went down to the road to meet him and they shouted, praise God, or Hosanna, some versions say. Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hail the king of Israel. And this is a quote from Psalms 118, verse 14. John tells us that Jesus found a donkey and he wrote it that he was fulfilling the prophecy. And the prophecy is from Zechariah chapter nine. It says, don't be afraid, people of Jerusalem. Look, your king is coming, riding on a donkey's colt. Verse 16. Listen, this is what I love. This is one of the reasons I love John and his writing because he's so honest, right? Like if you, if you write your story, right, you, you write yourself in the best light, right? You wanna make yourself look good. He writes himself as kind of like, uh, whoops, I screwed up. Look what he says. Verse 16, it says, his disciples didn't understand at the time that this was a fulfillment of the prophecy. Uh, we missed it, <laughs> uh, whoops, right? We missed it. But after Jesus entered his glory, meaning after Jesus ascended back into heaven, so later, (laughs) they remembered what happened and realized that these things had been written about about him. Here's why I love this. A, it makes me feel a little bit better about myself because I'm slow a lot of times, like, oh, I missed it. But this is a picture of the human story. This is a a picture of the discipleship journey, right? As we're trying to to align ourselves and follow Jesus and be in step with him. And there are times and moments where we get it and it feels so fluid and so, and there are times when we drift. And there's times when we get distracted. Look, look, bird. And there's times when things happen in our life. But here's the invitation to you and to me today. I think we could have a moment like Jacob and Joseph had, this kind of this recalibrate, this reset moment. Some of you, maybe you need this today. Maybe this is the slowest you're gonna be all week. Maybe it's the slowest you've been all month. See, I think the invitation to you and to me is to, to reset, to recalibrate. Oh, spring break, school's going back, all these things are happening. But the question is, where are you with Jesus right now? Where are you with Jesus? You look at Genesis, all the key players, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, the extras. I mean, they were all over the place. And I look around this room, some of you, you're here, but you're all over the place. And I think there's an opportunity like we see in Genesis to kind of stop to recalibrate, to go, hey, what's gonna be your anchor? What are you gonna choose to do? Are you gonna drift? Are you gonna be distracted? Or are you gonna come back to that one thing that the writer of Hebrews says, we have this hope as an anchor for the soul, for the soul firm and secure. And Jesus wants to be your rock. He wants to be your anchor. 
He's, he's, he's calling you, he's drawing you, he's pulling you and he wants to be your leader. He wants to be your guide. He wants to be your teacher, your rabbi. He's inviting us to be in step and in sync with him. But the question is, what are you gonna do with him? What are you gonna do with Jesus? And this is the perfect week to maybe rethink, to recalibrate, to reset. And around here, we, we've created opportunities all week. Though, why? We've created opportunities because we wanna help you take your next step. We wanna help you in your discipleship journey. We wanna help you follow Jesus. So if maybe some of you, you need to take some time this morning and we're just gonna create a minute here where maybe you just need to be still and, and lower the RPMs. What is Jesus saying to you? Maybe some of you, you need to, to, to really engage the Easter narrative, the Passion Week narrative. And maybe starting today, you, you wanna take John, the Gospel of John, John's eyewitness account, and you wanna start in John chapter 12, and you wanna read through the entire, it's John 12 to John 21. What would it look like for you to do that? Later this week, we're gonna have opportunity around the lake where, where you yourself or you could guide your family and, and engage in the passion narrative. There'll be opportunities here on Good Friday. There'll be opportunities next weekend on Saturday and on Sunday. Why? So that you can recalibrate, reset. And I'm just gonna invite us a, a little different today. I'm just gonna kind of invite us into a moment of reflection. We're gonna kind of go into a moment of communion but I'm gonna do it a little different today. I'm gonna, I'm gonna invite you, maybe you need to go into a time of confession. Maybe you need to go into a time of refocus. I just pray that God would speak and have his way however he wants to in this moment. What's gonna be your anchor? When you came in, you received a little packet and I'm just gonna invite you to pull that out and kind of self-guided. Jesus said that often as you gather together, do this, celebrate the Lord's cover. Why? To remember me. And so this is a, a recalibration, a reset, a remembrance moment. Jesus took the bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body broken for you. And then he took the cup. And he said, this is my blood, which is spilled out for you. So I'm gonna invite you now, just kind of in a moment of prayer. When you're ready, feel free to take the the bread represents the body of Jesus. When you're ready, feel free to take the cup, which represents the blood of Jesus. But I don't wanna rush through this moment. Because there's some of you that are here, maybe you don't even know why you're here. Maybe you got swept up in the traffic off Greenland Road. But I believe that God's here, he, he's speaking. And so God, I just pray over each and every person in this room, from wall to wall. God, these are, these are sons and daughters of God, people that you love. And God, you're drawing us to yourself. You want us, you wanna be that anchor in our lives. You, you want us to, to be in step and in sync with you, with you, God. You've called us to so much purpose and meaning. There's so many things that, that you have for us, God, but it's so much bigger and grander. But God, it's so easy to get distracted. It's so easy to lose focus. And so God, I pray today as we head into this beautiful week to celebrate that you gave your life, to celebrate that you're alive. I pray that this week, God, that, that, you would, that we could encounter you maybe in a fresh way, maybe in a different way. Maybe that you would break down. There's, there's some in here that have walls and barriers up. God, I pray that you would break that down, whatever you need to do. God, the, the fears, the doubts, the disappointments. God, I pray you'll meet each and every person here where you are. I'm just gonna encourage you to, to sit in this for a second. In a moment, the team is gonna come and lead us in a closing song. Feel free to sit and reflect, or if you wanna stand and sing, however you wanna do it. And so God, I, I just pray God, that Jesus, hallowed be your name. May you be lifted and exalted up, God. May, may this week, may you just be more real and more authentic and, and just more present than, than ever before. God, may we encounter you in fresh and new ways. God, may you do something in this church, in this community, in this city. So God, we love you and we pray in the mighty name of Jesus.
what you've done, Lord. Father, we thank you for this service. We thank you for the impartation in your word. We thank you, Lord, that what you've done for us, God, that we will share with someone else. We thank you all so much for coming. Make sure you hit the tags behind your chairs to give. And if you want to make the best decision of your life by giving your life to Christ, come down here to the front and there'll be here someone here to pray with you. Have an amazing week and we'll see you back next Sunday for Easter.